This week, we've been diving deep into artificial intelligence and how the world we see is changing as the technology advances. Today, we're going to talk about AI, creativity, and the arts. And joining us to look at AI's impact on the creative sector is Laura Lai Pepe. She's professor of animation, associate professor of animation at Emily Carr University. Thanks for being here. Appreciate your time. Dan, thank you very much. I appreciate being able to have this conversation. And it's a big one, uh, uh, particularly in, in your field of study with students. What are you telling them? about the impact of AI on their field? Not surprisingly, we don't have to tell them an awful lot because they are very much in tune with this. Our students have very strong opinions about what is taking place. Mm -hmm. They feel that there is a threat that is at their front door. They are thinking about this from the perspective of having dedicated themselves to becoming artists and what this means is a deep dive into who they are, how they feel, how they think, how they process and make intuitive decisions. They're learning skills that take decades to be able to develop and, and refine. And for that process of seeing oneself as an artist, that threat of what artificial intelligence does is the idea that they can somehow be supplanted, that their work is somehow capable of being modified and commodified in a way that is beyond their control, that artists themselves may be threatened in terms of their livelihoods, uh, and that somehow there is not enough of a border to talk about what the difference is between a human and the artificial intelligence when we talk about image generation. Huge amount of things to talk about and, and consider. We've, we yeah. are already starting to see the impact of AI. We've yeah. brought an example. Let's play a little bit from the Netflix anime short, The Dog and the Boy. Yes. So this was created partially by AI. Why is this so controversial? The reason that this is controversial is that this particular work represents animation that was done in combination with artificial intelligence. Specifically, the artificial intelligence was used to create the background art. And in the context of how they present it, they prepare us for this inevitability of AI stepping in by saying we're starting off with a, a collaboration. So they're bringing in the concept that artificial intelligence is being used, but it's softened with the idea that it's being facilitated by a human. And when we look at the credits with that short, the irony is that they are indicating that the backgrounds are created by AI, by AI mm -hmm. plus human. So they're not even indicating that there's an actual human with a name it involved. It just says plus human? Plus human. And so the, the degradation that takes place, I think they intended for it to be a positive. They just com completely drew yeah. themselves into a hole with this. Interesting. Yeah. Now, so, now you, you've also spent, pardon me, a, a lot of time thinking about AI and some of the, the stereotypes that work, uh, that reinforce it when it comes to art. And we've generated some, some graphic art, I think, in the style of notable painters. Our search terms were, quote, a beautiful woman in the style of, and then a painter or artist. We have some examples. Why don't we talk about these and, and how they're actually created? Here are the examples mm -hmm. here. Yeah. So what, what goes into this, do you think? Well, in the context of what we're seeing here, the search terms, this is called a text-to-image generation. Mm -hmm. The user puts in a series of words that they want to see sort of result in an image. Now, what happens is that it's calling upon a particular data set, so a range of images that have been data tagged with words that identify what is within an image. And so imagine just an enormous library made up of millions of images and millions of words. So when you put in that data tagging request, what you're getting is a result uh, that, that the AI assimilates and assumes to be the best possible match. Now, what we see happening within these data sets is that these data sets are very, very slanted. The majority of them have been generated through the North American internet. Mm -hmm. These data sets went out, they did what's called scraping. They go out and they send out bots. Imagine a, a fishing trawler with right. a net and they just grab everything mm -hmm. they can. And within that collection, they're 
has turned out to be a result of a strong predisposition towards particular mindsets and preferences, mm -hmm. towards representation. And the emphasis is on a particularly North American Caucasian that has a value in terms of beauty, mm -hmm. particularly for women. Um, and there is a slant in terms of thinking about the attitudes towards certain ethnicities, towards races. And speaking of which, we have an example when we put in the search terms and change them uh, at, to look at a, quote, exotic woman. I think this yes. was what we have here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what do you make of, of this? The term exotic has always been used to be able to refer to those who are other. Yeah. And that Essentially non-white. Non-white, yeah. yes. And so that othering is a way to be able to distance, to be able to separate and create a different category. Mm -hmm. And that, that distancing, that kind of categorization is, is a denigration. And so with this kind of ethnic slant, with this racist attitude that comes through, what we see revealed is a, a, a dominant perspective mm -hmm. that is looking at a system of values. And so we, we see a data set that is not representative of the world. It is highly reflective of a particular clientele, mm -hmm. basically. And some of it is highly sexualized. This is a significant problem. And so with the data sets, particularly one that dominates and it's currently housed in Germany, uh, Leon, L-A-I-O-N, the content has been found to contain such troubling material, things that refer to rape and pornography, to uh, ethnic slurs, to racial prejudice. Uh, it, it's really a, a very substantial representation of content that is within this. So there was a huge outcry when these started to emerge and started to become obvious that these data sets were very problematic. And so the companies started to pull back and started to use more intentional filtering. They tried to put up gates, per se, but the problem is they had released these data sets open source. Anybody and everybody could get them, and so many people did. So regardless of putting up these gates to prevent people from accessing these kinds of harmful representations, there are plenty of people who know how to get around them, and they have. Mm -hmm. And so those continue to be dispersed, continue to be distributed and used. Lastly, and we, I appreciate your time and your expertise, yeah. for artists who are looking at this material, mm -hmm. what are the ways that they can protect themselves, do you think? Where do we see, where do we see them stepping up? Hmm. or being helped to step up. Yeah, being helped to step up is a good way to think about that right now. In the context of artists being able to protect their work, for many of us who have had the work online, that horse is gone, it's gone way down, it's past the street, it's in another country, and it's almost impossible to be able to extract your work. So some artists are using legal recourse, they're taking companies to the court. And for example, there's an artist who is suing to be able to have their content specifically removed from the database. That's a very sort of elemental way to be able to approach it. At a higher level, there are people who are looking at being able to challenge what is artificial generation and its relationship to human generated images and copyright. And so US copyright has determined that content generated by artificial intelligence is not considered creative. It is not considered mm. something that a human would do. At the most aggressive level, there's a current software and system that's being brought out called Nightshade. Yes. And this is a system of cloaking one's content, one's images, in an invisible language. So imagine that you've created a painting of a dog on the beach, sure. and you process it with this software, and you have the software create a sub-pixel set of information that makes a data system think it's seeing a handbag. And if you do this with all of the images, when these data sets are doing the scraping and pulling in of all these images, it ends up with corrupted data. And so the AI cannot function. It thinks it's seeing one thing, but it's not. And so it sends back this information so that that a uh, person that you wanted to have an image of suddenly has six legs and a head is a, is a tire. <laughs> it's sabotage. It's sabotage. It is absolutely yeah. sabotage. So there's various levels of what's being taken, and I think that this sabotage level is a response to people feeling such deep threat and powerlessness that there's a willingness to be able to push and force these companies to be responsible and to recognize 
their level of um, responsibility and, mm -hmm. and the debt that's owed to having made quite a bit of money uh, off of artists. Lorelai Pepe, we really appreciate your time and your expertise. You've given us a lot to think about. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you.